That was exciting. Well, a number of you have inquired as to my uh, health status. I am here. I am fine. I overextended my uh, Achilles tendon on my right uh, leg last week, and it, um, or, or the week before last, actually, and, and by Sunday, it had been fully inflamed for over a day, and uh, I couldn't really walk. Uh, I couldn't put any weight on my right foot, and I finally gave in to uh, all the doctor's advice and got off my foot and got onto a couch and lifted my foot up and demanded cheeseburgers and everything all day long and, and made my poor wife run around. Uh, and so after doing that for a couple of days and taking uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, I woke up uh, and it was just gone finally. It was, the swelling was down so I could stand on it. In the Talmud, which is a Jewish document from the Middle Ages, there's a story told. Uh, the story is told from the time before, a century before Jesus even, about um, a Gentile who wanted to convert to Judaism. And he said, the legend goes, that he would accept Judaism if a rabbi could teach him the entire Torah while he, the prospective convert, stood on one foot. So the one great teacher of the time, Shammai, was insulted by this and threw him out. Uh, the other great teacher of the time was Hillel, and he took the challenge. And so uh, while this man stood on one foot, he said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. The rest is explanation. Go and study it. So last week, that's about all you would have gotten out of me. <laughs> because I would have been standing on one foot. I chose to let the injury heal. Uh, many times we underrate our need for rest and for healing. Paul, whom we are studying, and you might start turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, Acts being the acts of the apostles and the story of uh, the people of Jesus after he went into heaven. Paul was a man who drove himself hard. Uh, he was that guy. He was just wired that way and he went for it. Uh, but he's now in his 40s and he has been driving hard on behalf of the Lord for some time. And so last week we left him in Athens. He had been secreted out of uh, Thessalonica, I think, and, and uh, because trouble was coming his way. And he had been beat up by rods, uh, with rods, by a mob in Philippi and uh, just abused. And so... When things like that happen to you, even, even, especially when you do them on behalf of the Lord, uh, those things, you pay a cost for that. It still hurts. It still takes time to heal. And you pay that price. And that's the price you pay for following the Lord. Well, let's begin our story. Let's begin our text at the beginning of chapter 18. Uh, after these things, which is everything that happened in Athens, after these things, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, which is not far away in Greece. And there he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius, who was emperor of Rome, had commanded all Jewish people to leave Rome. Politicians have always found it convenient uh, to blame, to have someone to blame for all the problems that they are experiencing and the ones they are causing themselves. And so the Jewish people got blamed. So he apparently had heard about them in some way and he met them. Verse 3, and because of the... And he was also healing physically 
and mentally, and I think we'll see this in this, this passage, trauma takes time to heal. Uh, swollen tissues take time to resolve. Things that happen to you take time for you to mentally get your mind around uh, what happened. Interesting thing is that he's talking only in the synagogue. It says he's talking to Jewish and Greek people. That would be the, the God-fearers, uh, the Gentiles who were in the synagogue, who would come every week and they would pray to the God, the one God of the universe, who is the God of Israel. And they would read the scripture. Uh, there was no there was not yet a New Testament. There was the law, the prophets, and the writings. And so they were, there were people who actually believed uh, that that was the right way. They weren't converted to Judaism, these, these Greek people, most of them, I think. Um, but that's, that was just kind of his regular life mode. He's working, going to church. We get that. And then... Um, Later on, now this is all coming to us via Luke, because Luke wrote the book of Acts down. Now he probably got a lot of information from Paul and saw a good bit of it himself. Uh, but now uh, let's, let's look at, listen to what Paul has to say about it in his letters, because the place he left was Thessalonica, and he was just there a very short amount of time. And so he led some people to the Lord, and he had been really physically abused in Philippi. So the believers there said, just, just get him out of here before, before he, this happens to him here. So they kept him hidden uh, away from the, the public beatings and all of that in Thessalonica uh, and Berea and all those places. And, and so he eventually, they just said, go to Athens, please, and stay out of trouble so we can finish up here. Uh, so he writes a letter probably while he's in Corinth at some time, back to the Thessalonians and talks about this time when he was with the Thessalonians and then coming out of there. This is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 in verse 17 going into chapter 3 verse 5. He says, brothers and sisters, after we were orphaned by separation from you for a short time, we were separated from you, we were separated in person, not in heart. We were all the more eager in our great longing to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, but Satan thwarted us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Paul saying, I want to stand before Jesus and say, these are the children that you have given me, the spiritual children that I have brought into this, this heavenly place. He goes on, verse 20, for you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind alone in Athens. Stuck in Athens. We sent Timothy, our brother and co-worker for God, in proclaiming the good news of Messiah Jesus. Timothy, in other words, our, our fellow evangelist, who doesn't seem to get beat up as much as I do. Um, we sent him in order to strengthen and encourage you in our faith. In other words, Timothy was left behind with the Thessalonians in order to disciple. And that is the job we, we're here for. That's why we're here, to make disciples. That is our church's mission statement. Be disciples, make disciples. That's what we do. That's why God has put us here. And so Paul is just making this very clear. That's why I left Timothy there, because you just came to know the Lord, and I had to leave, and I just really wanted to be with you, but I can't. So I'm sending Timothy, and he will encourage you and teach you. Um, Verse 3, uh, I sent him to you to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be shaken by these afflictions. Uh, how fast would this place clear out if, if, if it meant some of us were getting beat up and thrown in jail and losing our jobs? You know, that would, that would, make, a little, that would make it a little harder to come here. 
And that was just part of being a follower of Jesus at the very beginning in these places. He says, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For even when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer uh, persecution, just as has happened, as you know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faithfulness for fear that the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might be in vain. So Paul is, is in Corinth. He's working. He's going to, to, to synagogue. And he's thinking about the people he left behind, the new believers, the baby followers of Jesus who need to be disciples. And he's so glad that Timothy and Silas could be there. Maybe Luke. Athens had rejected him, but it wasn't a violent rejection. And so he, he goes on then to Corinth, and then he explains that time in Corinth later on when he's somewhere else writing back to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, and he's talking about this healing process, this physical healing process perhaps uh, that is going on while he's in Corinth. He says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, uh, perhaps as a result of this being beaten up. We don't know that. Uh, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself because Paul is very driven and very strong. He says, I pleaded with the Lord three times about this, that it might leave me this physical problem I'm having. And we think we have some indication, perhaps, that, that it was some problem with his eyesight. Uh, he says in another place that, that he, he can barely see. Uh, but the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. The power, the power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, uh, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Messiah Jesus may dwell in me. For Messiah's sake, then, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in calamities. So he's, he's associating this thorn in the flesh with these persecutions and calamities. He, he wraps up, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So the injuries from the persecutions are slowing him down. And God says, Paul, I want you to live with it. I want you to live with it because it's a reminder that it's not you, even though you're a strong, tough guy, it's not you doing this in your own strength. And Paul can't help but be reminded that his Lord Jesus had said, Following me is going to cost you something. Count the cost before you say you're my follower because you're going to be picking up your own cross to follow me. Those are hard things. And so Paul is healing. He's making tents with his new friends who are fellow uh, what they call in the Jewish world these days, fellow members of the tribe. If a Jewish person sees a, a mezuzah on your door, he'll say, so you're a member of tribe? Uh, it's, a, it's kind of an inside, uh, a little bit of a, a humor there. But not only were they fellow Jews, they were fellow believers in Jesus. And so he was uh, close with them and going to services. He was going to the services where they were reading the law, the prophets, and the writings, and Paul was letting them know. I'm sure he was known as Saul in the synagogue. Uh, he was letting them know that this Jesus, the Messiah, was in fact the fulfillment of all that was being said in that law and that pro those prophets and those writings. Let's press on in the text. Acts, uh, we're at Acts chapter 18 and verse 5. Now, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, which is out east of Greece and uh, now part of Greece, but it's where Philippi was, 
when they arrived from Macedonia, Paul became occupied with the message. In other words, he probably wrapped up his tent-making business and got down to the business of sharing this gospel in a more intent, uh, intentful way, if I can use that word. He became occupied with the message, urgently testifying to the Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Mark Parker and I were just discussing the other day the Robert's Rules of Order. It's about civil discourse. Uh, and I was telling him that, that from the time when we were part of a Messianic congregation in, in Chicago, we were part of several meetings, and, and they did not use Robert Rules of Order. In fact, Another joke in that community is that there's a Jewish rules of order for meetings, and one of, the, one of the elements of that is being able to, at any point, make a point of outrage. Uh, and so Paul is nothing if not Jewish, and he says, your blood is on your own heads, I'm clean, I'm out of here. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And so Paul has shifted gears. He had this time of rest, and he had this time of, of just being a regular person for a while, but Timothy and Silas have showed up, so now it's time to get to work in this place, Corinth. And so going to the Gentiles is still a very dramatic move. This brings him down in the eyes of his own people. What is he doing? Why would he? Now, we don't mind that the Gentiles come into the synagogue because they see the rightness of the law of Moses and the prophets, uh, but to go out where they are, what is that? Uh, but that's, that's what Paul is now engaged with. And so uh, in verse 7, I'm going to continue on with the text. After leaving there, Paul went into the house of a man named Titius Justus, a God-fearer. That means he's a Gentile who's going to the synagogue. He's a member or a participant in it, a God-fearer whose house was next door to the synagogue. How annoying is that to the synagogue, that Paul's now living next door with a Gentile, no less, even though he's all right because he comes to our synagogue, but he's not really a member of the tribe. See, a lot of stuff going on here. Verse 8 now it really gets annoying. It goes beyond annoying. Crispus, the synagogue leader, who would be a Jewish fellow, put his faith in the Lord along with his whole household. That's it. And many of the Corinthians, upon hearing about this, were believing and being baptized. So the synagogue is, is like being dissembled by Paul. Now, Paul's not trying to bring them out of the synagogue. He would like to stay in there and, and continue this conversation and bring these new people in at the same time. Now, I'm sure that, you know, if the God-fearers want to follow Paul, I get it because they always know that they're not quite a member of the tribe uh, with us. You know, they don't have relatives that live in the city of Jerusalem that can provide for them an apartment to stay in when they go to Passover. They've got a different deal going on. But when he's taking the leader of our synagogue and his whole household, that word again, oikos, we talk about that. Oikos is my world, uh, the world I'm connected with. So this would be his children. Uh, grandchildren if he's that old, any relatives that live under his roof, any employees, they're all coming and being baptized in the Lord Jesus. So my question here is, is Paul, when he shifted gears, is this Paul back in Superman mode? I think not. I think the next bit uh, tells us that. Look at verse 9. Now the Lord said to Paul, through a vision in the night, which doesn't happen all that often, I think, the Lord said to Paul, do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. 
Why would the Lord say, do not be afraid? Probably because Paul was a little bit afraid. He probably had PTSD like all of us get. If you have a mob descend on you and try to kill you more than once, you get a little jumpy. He'll do it, but he's still feeling a little jumpy about it. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent, for I am with you and no one shall attack you to harm you. Ah, you get a break from the beatings for a while. I'm going to protect you in a special way from that. Many people in this city are for me. So he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. 18 months, a year and a half. Paul never stays anywhere that long uh, that, that we get to hear about. So that's amazing. And what was he doing? He was discipling. He was teaching the word of God. And so this, this church in Corinth was built around a leadership of synagogue people, uh, people who had a biblical worldview and understood uh, biblical morality, biblical kinds of organization for a group like this. And um, what even the Jews and the Gentiles, they were coming out of that synagogue. Uh, and so they were, they were like, uh, like when we do church planning. Very often it's people who have grown up in church who kind of understand what it means to live in a community of believers. That's a valuable thing if you raise your children in the church because they understand what that looks like. They understand the reality of that, the practical reality of that. And that's largely what's going on here. And so uh, this church was built on those people, and the Lord assured him that there would be no more physical trauma for now. So Paul, I want you to continue to teach and to speak out and to continue to heal for a time. And that's a good question for us. You know, we've just been through a year of all kinds of things happening to us, We've been traumatized. We've been traumatized politically. We've been traumatized physically. Uh, we just had a member who spent 12 days on a respirator with this COVID um, and is home again, thanks to God. Uh, you don't just walk away from stuff like that and forget about it. That sticks in your head. And so you need some time to heal. And we need that too. And, and my point being, and the point here is, it's okay to do that. You take the time you need to heal up from the trauma that life brings. Well, let me continue on. In verse 12, but while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, that's a regional uh, governor of some sort, like uh, Pontius Pilate was, uh, the Jewish leaders made a united attack against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat. So apparently not something violent, but rather something uh, legal, uh, maybe arrested, and saying, this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law of Moses or to the Torah. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jewish people, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or a vicious crime, there would be a reason to put up with you, O oh Jews. See, he can't tell them from one another. Some of you believe in Jesus, some don't. I don't care. You're all from the same tribe. Get out of here. But since it is issues about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I do not wish to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the judgment seat. And then they all grabbed Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. Spared Paul, but poor Sosthenes. And, but Gallio paid no attention to these things. Now, the first thing to note is that uh, we've shared this communion table today with full knowledge that every one of us is completely capable as a human being of joining a mob that is within all of us. One of the things that they find out when they help people through 
PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, disorder, is that especially for soldiers coming off the battlefield, one of the things that they are really deeply psychically disturbed about is not what's happened to them, but things that they found themselves able to do on the field of battle. I had no idea I could do such a horrible thing, but I did, and I can't live with me anymore. That's a big deal. So we're all capable of being part of that mob. And who is this Sosthenes fellow? That's a, that's a question, because in Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians, Sosthenes is listed in the first verse of the letter as the person with, which, with whom Paul is writing the letter. So we don't know if this is the same guy. We don't know if he has become a believer and was the synagogue leader after uh, Crispus was. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, but it makes some sense to think that he might be uh, a believer now that, he's, that they're beating him up as well. Uh, and so we don't exactly know what happened with him. Uh, but again, this situation is going south. Um, and and let, well, let's press on here. Verse 18, Paul, having stayed many more days in Corinth, said farewell to the brothers and set sail uh, to Syria, which is to say to go home to Israel. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. At Cancrea, uh, which is a city not far from, from where they were in Corinth, uh, I'm sure just a place they stopped in their boat, Paul had his hair cut off for he was keeping a vow. Now we're not exactly sure what that's about, but it has something to do with him going to the temple and uh, making a sacrifice as the fulfillment of this vow. And uh, it's perhaps to assure the Jerusalem church that he is indeed still a member of the tribe, uh, even though he goes directly to the Gentiles with this gospel. Uh, Paul still kept the law as a practicing uh, Jew, uh, and, and the, the Judaism he was practicing was a messianic, biblical Judaism, uh, there really wasn't a rabbinic Judaism in the form it presently is in those days. Uh, the closest thing would have been what the Pharisees were preaching. But uh, rabbinic Judaism didn't come to be until after the destruction of the temple. Judaism had to reinvent itself because it didn't have a sacrifice anymore uh, or a place to make sacrifices. And so one of the basic pillars of modern rabbinic Judaism is that we don't follow Jesus. It was a response to these guys, but that wasn't there yet. So Paul was, was comfortable with his own, this was a tribal thing, it was a, a part of being his own people. He understood very clearly and spoke it many, many times very clearly. This is not about my salvation. This ain't how you get saved. But he also, you know, this was his connection to his people. Uh, that's why he had Timothy circumcised earlier in the book, because you're Jewish. And if you want to talk to these people, you can't be in the same category as an outsider. And so he kept this door open to his own people. And, and just one further comment. Uh, when you think about Jesus, Jesus was a member of that tribe. And if you were to say to Jesus... I love you, but I don't like your family. He would say, perhaps, then I, I, I guess you don't want to be in my family. So, the family comes along with Jesus, and that's part of the deal. Uh, God had said to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless. Those you, who curse you, I will curse. Um, well, let's finish this, this chapter or this, this section, uh, verse 19, when they arrived at Ephesus, so he's headed back from Greece to Israel, he stops in Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey, not far from where he grew up in Tarsus, and it doesn't, we don't know that he'd ever been there before, not on one of his missions trips. He left Priscilla and Aquila there, his friends that he'd made tents with, left him at Ephesus, but he himself went into the synagogue and debated with the Jewish people, couldn't stop, 
And when they asked him to stay longer, he declined. Instead, taking leave of them, saying, uh, while well, saying, God willing, I'll return to you again. He was probably heading home to make it in time for the holidays uh, at the temple. And so he set sail from Ephesus, and after landing at Caesarea, which is in Israel on the coast, uh, he went up, and perhaps that means Jerusalem. When you go up, you're going to Jerusalem. He went up and greeted uh, Messiah's community or the, or, or the church there, and then he went down to Antioch. In other words, he went home. And I gather by himself. And sometimes you just need to go home. Like it's snowing outside, so we probably need to go home pretty soon. The point of this being is that discipling, resting, and healing are, are central to being a follower of Jesus. It's not always being out there in the marketplace causing a stir and starting a fight and starting a this or a that. It's what we do here. It's this teaching the word to one another. Uh, Paul said to this same group in Thessalonica in, a letter, in his letter to them, and Peter said also in his letter, make it your goal to live a quiet, respectable life as a follower of Jesus. That's sort of the... You know, we forget that, but that is the, the baseline for following the Lord. Uh, and so, in our discipling here, um, I wanted to let you know about something. Uh, I've, I, I have written a book, as you know, a couple of years ago. This is a discipleship book. It's called Bible for Self-Starters. Uh, the idea being that if you want to uh, be serious, a self-starter is somebody who does this because it's the right thing to do and they want to do it and they're motivated, like people who start their own businesses are called self-starters. And so this is about if you want to bring uh, your understanding of this book into that area of your life where you're most competent at work or whatever it else is, is, it is you do in your life, um, this is a way to do this. And so this is a walk through um, the, um, the eras and the characters in the Bible story and they're short little chapters, and the reason I'm telling you this is because I know most of you probably have a copy of this book already. And now I'd like for uh, some of you to actually read this book. Uh, so that's a different thing, and I appreciate the fact that you have the book. Now, now go ahead and look at it. Um, and if you do that, and if you, if, this is not a book that lends itself very well to speed reading or skimming. It's not hard, it is accessible, it's not an academic book, it's, it's written at a popular level, but it does take some, just sit down and read it, uh, and, and it'll give you a break. Every page or two, it will have a meditation place, and it will have a couple deeper still questions, and this is discipleship. Uh, this is, and the reason I, I am pushing this to you today is be, for two reasons. <clears throat> Number one, it's written for us. Uh, I wrote this book, having been here for a decade, and I'm coming on to my 11th year here pretty quick. And so I'm, I wrote this uh, with us in mind. This is discipleship. This is how uh, I read this book, and you've been hearing me teach this way for all this time. And so I would encourage you to go ahead and begin reading that, and even uh, to the point of saying, well, maybe I could... Maybe I could teach someone else. Someone else and I could sit down and read this together, and we could work through this. And I happen to know the author, and I happen to know that he would just be thrilled if you called him and said, what do you mean by this on page whatever? Okay? So do that. I would love that. Uh, now, the other reason I mention this is because uh, I have now a uh, YouTube site. Wah, wah, wah. So just go to YouTube, type my name in, and it'll give you my little picture. Click on that, and it'll take you to my YouTube site, and there are 22 little three to four minute videos, uh, one for each of the chapters in this book. So if you're going through this and wanna read it and go, you know, I'm not getting any traction with this, go to that website, look at that video for that chapter, uh, and, and then, and then call me and say, what are you talking about? Uh, I would love that. Uh, and then uh, my, my hope is that you would take that on as a goal uh, soon. 
and do that because I have another book coming out uh, that's almost finished. And that book is another discipleship book, and this takes it out a little further. This is a reading plan for the Bible that will take you through the Bible story, not the complete Bible text, because that is a heavy burden to carry. It's not heavy to carry it by yourself, but it's hard to teach your children reading through every story. There's some stories in the Bible that kids just aren't going to be ready for for some time. And so the idea of this reader is that you can read through uh, three readings a week, which is the amount of readings the rabbis thought that a family could actually get to uh, in ancient times, and that's why they divided the Torah readings up into three chunks a week uh, in ancient times. And so this will give you three readings a week for one year, and it'll take you through the whole Bible story, and each reading will have one story from the Bible that's right after the last story, and, uh, and then it also has a second passage that is from, say you're reading in the book of Genesis, it'll give you a second passage from the book of Romans or somewhere else that talks about this story uh, where the Bible's conversing with itself or commenting on itself or the same principle. So uh, if you get this one all done, I'll have another one waiting for you, and then uh, there, are this, there are some questions with each of these passages, and I'm trying to set the level of those questions so that a parent could sit with a fifth or sixth grader and answer those questions. So it's a chance to disciple someone, to be a disciple and to make a disciple. So that's what's coming. The Lord has good things for us. Sometimes it's in amazing, exciting things that, you know, the, the fireworks are going off. And other times it's happening in your living room on a snowy day. And so let's give thanks to the Lord and make our way home in the snow. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be a disciple.